Hello? What? Hey, how you doing? Hey, I am actually doing really well. I had a good week for a change, and nice. that feels very refreshing to me. <laughs> so, yeah, that's me. How about you? I'm doing great. Uh, first of all, it's morning. Normally, we are talking in the evening, and in the morning, I am always a lot more excitable because I am a morning person. And second of all, last week or the week before, we were talking about this Bible that I was going to order, and it came yesterday, and I Ooh. love it. What did you go with, by the way? It is the ESV Heritage Single Column Leather Bound Bible. Wow. Yes. So it's very pretty. It feels really nice. It looks really elegant. And all the words are there. So that's great. <laughs> uh, that's awesome. Yeah. That's great. I'm so glad you went with that one. Did you feel okay about it in the end? Yeah, I just blamed it on you. I was like, well, he said I should buy it, so I'm buying it. <laughs> I'm glad. I am going to hell for a lot of people. I'm just, that's that's how I'm operating my life. I'm just taking on everybody else's blame. You know, I knew somebody else who did that. Oh, I did not mean it like that, but <laughs> wow. <laughs> You're a heretic. Uh, yeah, I really feel like one. Now I really need to repent. <laughs> okay, Kip, please introduce the topic. We got to move on. Uh, you know, it is the holiday season, and this has me thinking all about kind of the classic phrase, keeping Christ in Christmas. And I've got so many different thoughts about this, but the thing I want to start off talking about is... The idea of, and I, I don't even know the, the right way to kind of encapsulate this, but marking seasonal remembrances, right? Like at some point early in the church, the church fathers decided we got to make sure every year we come back to the incarnation and the resurrection, those are incredibly important, and we want to come back to them every year. And I just think that's interesting. Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, what What would you like to explore with that? Well, I, okay, let's start here. You're an MDiv student, soon to finish, be finishing your MDiv. I have my Master of Divinity. We have all the chops we need to be able to answer this question. Let's Put yourself in their shoes, the early church fathers. You get three things you want the church to come back to every year, and you're going to make a, a celebration out of each one. What would your three be? Oh, you know, I'm trying to go through some of Jesus's life events and what kind of stands out? What are the big moments? And I think Jesus walking on water, that would be a cool annual experience, right? Like we just combine it with Ooh, baptism, yes, I think. Yes, let's do that. <laughs> um, so Jesus walking on water, I don't think would be one, but I think it would be wildly entertaining. But Jesus feeding the 5,000, that seems to come up in multiple gospels it seems to be a pivotal moment. It's right it, in some gospel tellings. It's right after uh, John the Baptist dies and Jesus goes and tries to pray for a while and the crowds keep finding him. And then eventually he just sits them all down and he feeds them all. So that seems to be significant. So maybe we have a feast around that. We have Jesus's ascension Right, We talk about the resurrection or the crucifixion and the resurrection, but we don't really talk about the ascension. So maybe I'd include that. Or the transfiguration, where he's up on the mountain and you know all sorts of interesting people show up. That would also be a fascinating annual remembrance. Um, yeah. So I don't know, I, but I think I would keep the crucifixion and the resurrection because that at least is told in all four Gospels. Whereas, oddly enough, Christmas is not. The birth of Jesus is only in two out of the four Gospels. 
and really only gets significant treatment in Luke. So it's fascinating that we as a church have decided we're going to come back to this every single year when two gospel writers didn't even think it worthy to include in Jesus' story. Yeah, right? Like, So this is super interesting to me, I think, on a theological level that John decides he's just going to do in the beginning was the word. He'd heard the the incarnation story enough times. He's like, I'm doing something different. It's going to be cool. Um, mm. And so he does this whole poem thing. But then, yeah, Mark just skips it completely. John Mark, Peter's protege. So this is Peter's perspective. And Peter has nothing to say about the birth of Jesus. And this is the earliest gospel, Mark, right? Yeah, right, um, right. But but it is interesting, Matthew and Luke, who both presumably have read Mark's gospel, are like, ooh, you missed something important. Mm. Um, and they add it in. And Luke, in really great detail, and I don't know if scholars all agree that this is the case, but I think many scholars have presumed that Luke had to have spoken with Mary because some of the details he includes are things only Mary would know. And so if Mary was one of Luke's primary sources, you can see how the birth of Jesus becomes way significant. I mean, she's got to narrate that in huge detail. Oh, that's a good point. You can't say things like, Mary treasured up all these things in her heart unless you have had a conversation with Mary. Yeah. That's amazing. I hadn't even thought about that. Now I want to go back and reread Luke looking for Mary's influences, her perspective. Yeah. And I want to, too, not just for the birth narrative, but throughout the whole book. Like, what could have been influenced by Mary? That would be really, really fascinating. That would be. But let me even back up from here. You assumed that if you were going to signpost certain key things throughout the year, they would be events in Jesus' life. I didn't even assume that in my, my like if I was just asking the question, what are three things I want to hit regularly with my people? Like I want to make sure the church comes back to these. My list doesn't actually have things from Jesus' life in it. Oh, I'm glad that you have something to repent of. Yeah, right? Um, <laughs> yes, and I'm obviously, because the conversation is framed around Christmas and Easter, I know the right answer is things about Jesus' life. But like, as I was brainstorming, I, I would want like salvation is actually the way I would have framed it. Uh, and even this, I think, is very interesting. Salvation, I might have hit the crucifixion. I think it's fascinating, and this is a conversation for a different holiday, but the fact that I would probably have made the crucifixion the high point and focus, and we need to always be pulled towards the resurrection being the high point and the focus, is very interesting yeah. to me. But again, we have that holiday coming up. We can have that conversation another time. But And by the way, in preparation for that episode, if you've got some theological brain space— I recommend Michael Gorman's book, Cruciformity, where he talks about Paul's theology of living out a life of crucifixion, living out the life of the cross. I feel like that would be an awesome launching point. Excellent. Ooh. Yes. Michael Gorman and Nijay Gupta. Yes. Two amazing scholars. Yes. Have I told you that Nijay was my... TA for Greek in seminary. You did mention that because Dr. Gupta was also a professor at the college where I want to get my master's in counseling. He's no longer there, but we had talked about that connection as well. That's right. It makes me laugh. I now remember talking about this because I refer to him as Nijay because I knew him when he was not doctor. And you refer to him as Dr. Gupta because you know of him as a professor. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but yeah, so, so that was on my list, but then my list also had things like, 
These are the fences of orthodoxy. We got to build these things into the year because they are the essentials for orthodoxy, which is my working assumption for why you would do something every year. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, You know, it would be things like Trinity, which is a thing. There is a Trinity Sunday, but it is a much lower emphasis than the incarnation, obviously. But I would probably make it a much more significant emphasis than the incarnation. I also Hmm. was thinking in terms of a theology Sunday and obedience Sunday. I, I just, I think it's interesting that from a church leadership perspective, these holidays focus on Christ himself rather than orthodoxy, if that makes sense. Sure. It's much more about remembering Jesus than it is uh, instilling right doctrine. Yeah. And I find that absolutely fascinating. Which I think makes it more nebulous, if if you will. I mean, I think people like to bandy about the phrase, keep Christ in Christmas. And it's... <sighs> I get where where people are coming from, but it also has been used so much it becomes cheesy. And Mm -hmm. I don't think people are always very clear on what they mean by that. And I think, honestly, because it's difficult to know how to keep that clear, because we're not talking about adhering to right doctrine. We're talking about remembering a person who, in this case, is being incarnated as a baby in a really wild, crazy, chaotic scene. And yes. and that's and that's it. That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to remember something. And no, remember someone. W- right. Yes. Thank you. And so, how do you like? I don't know. Sit down and remember more. Like, it's it's really nebulous. It's really hard to know. Like, what is the appropriate way to quote keep Christ in Christmas? Yeah. Well, and so let me kind of transition here and then ask you. How satisfied are you with your own remembrance of Christ in the Christmas season? Yeah, I find myself dissatisfied with this every single year. And I really mean those words, dissatisfied. I don't mean I have a lot of guilt. I don't mean I have this sense of should and I didn't measure up. That's not at all what I mean. I mean dissatisfied, like I have a longing for more and I didn't get it. And that's often my experience at the end of the Christmas season or, you know, Christmas Day even. I get like, you know, I don't know if you have the same experience, like midway through Christmas Day, like all the presents are open. There is the detritus of Christmas everywhere. And you're going, okay, well, that's done now. We did the thing. And we spent a lot of busy weeks leading up to the thing, and now we're done, and I really don't know what it was all for. That is the general sense I get right around noon on Christmas Day, about every year. So, I don't know, on 1 to 10, it's not very high. 3? Yeah. I think amongst Christians, what you just described is very normal. I even think it's a little different from if we were to look back at our Thanksgiving episode that we talked about how sometimes there's an angst or frustration about thinking about thankfulness on Thanksgiving. (laughs) Uh, Yeah. There's a negativity about it that we has to get pushed out of the way. I, I think this is different. I think that this is closer to disappointment than frustration for many Mm, people. That's a good word. Yeah. But I want to pause here. We always say this towards the end of the episode. I want to turn mid-conversation to our listeners. We have a post out today that asks where you're at with Christmas. And I want to ask you, even if you have never commented on one of our posts on Facebook or Instagram. We are so curious 
Uh, we were having this conversation, but even before we started recording, our sense is that a lot of you are in this same place of wanting something else from Christmas other than what you get. And so I don't know if disappointed is the, always the right word, but there's some sort of sense of lack and anticipation that's not fulfilled. That's my sense of where a lot of people are at. But I want to just say it's it's really important to us to know where you're really at, not where we think you're at. And so you might love Christmas and everything about it and have just positive thoughts and feelings, or you might have very frustrated negative feelings or anything else. You might, quite honestly, have both of those at the same time. I would just ask if you could one, two, three words. If you want to do more, that's great. But I would love to know where you're at with Christmas this year. Yeah, I would love to know that as well. But I also want to add a comment to the audience. I work in the 911 industry. I know what the holidays do for a lot of people's mental health. And people have some negative family experiences or uh, they've recently encountered a death or something mm. like that. And the holidays just don't feel the way that they think they should. If you are there, by no means are you obligated to post on our on our thing. I just want to speak to all of you and say, I hear you. I know you're out there. That's hang in point. there. Yeah. Hang in there. I am. I'm with you. Yeah. I, I think you're right. I, Christmas has such a wide range of responses from such a wide range of people. And I might even post literally a number line one to 10. How satisfied are you with your experience of Christmas or something like that? just so that people can share without having to give too much detail because it's such a public space. Uh, there's a lot that goes into our experience of Christmas. I think it puts a magnifying glass on our lives and our satisfaction with life in general and maybe yeah. just heightens that. Yes, it does for me. <sighs> and maybe this is why this is so valuable. You know, we talk about spiritual habits all the time, and real life is about habits that help keep my relationship with Jesus connected to my real life mm. and bring life from the one to the other, infuse Jesus' life into my life. Yeah. And Christmas brings my life in all of its shades and colors and complications and chaos into such a clear contrast. If I can remember Jesus in the midst of that, I'm doing, I have some habits in place that'll work the rest of the time too. And so maybe that's the reset. Right. Well, it makes me really, um, I have this sense of longing for the very same hashtag we introduced a couple of weeks ago, hashtag come Lord Jesus. Mm -hmm. So I want to renew my ask of our audience, continue to post comments or pictures or whatever about your holiday experience with the hashtag come Lord Jesus. I want, exactly as you just described, I want Jesus to come and meet me in the midst of my mess. And I feel my mess more pointedly at the holidays than at any other time. So mm -hmm. come, Lord Jesus, into this mess. Uh, that's my heart's cry. Uh, that, and that is a different thing to me than the cheesy phrase, keep Christ in Christmas. Right? All of a sudden, I, I feel like I have this anxiety that I have to like scramble around and do Christian-y things and make sure that I make a birthday cake for Jesus or something. Like I just have to come up with some way to honor God because I'm supposed to keep Christ in Christmas. And that's a different thing for just longing for the presence of God in 
my holiday experience. I feel like those produce different practices. Well, and I, I think you're absolutely right. They also produce a, a different heart posture. You know, keep mm. Christ in Christmas. Who's the one doing the action there? Oh, I am. right. Yeah. Yeah. Come Lord Jesus. Who's the one doing the action there? He is. Yeah. Keep Christ in Christmas commands me to fix it. Daggum, I don't know how to fix it. I've been trying hard. <laughs> I mean, I try so hard to be spiritual at Christmas. And for generations, like, it brings up the mental picture of the family with the 18-month-old and the three-year-old that is restraining their children by, like, tying them down to the couch so they can read the entire account from Luke before they open presents, right? Yeah, um, yeah. Man, let's be spiritual about this. And to be clear, if you read the Christmas account before you open presents and that works for your family, that's wonderful. And I'm delighted that it works for you. No sarcasm intended. If it works for you, that's great. But feeling obligated to do those things because that's what it means to keep Christ in Christmas because the onus is on me, that just makes me tired. <laughs> yes and an, and makes me annoy everybody around me right because I'm, yeah because now shoehorning I'm, yes i'm shoving jesus down everybody's throats because like we got to keep christ in christmas that's what our spiritual duty is yeah as opposed to like i can feel my muscles relax when i go from keep christ in christmas to come lord jesus yeah because all of a sudden it's just not about me I'm miraculously, it shifts me away from having to be the savior of my Christmas, which is great because that to me is the point. <laughs> right. Yeah. I am grateful that you keep coming to this hashtag because one of my strengths is that I get very excited about things. But I am not always great at keeping a routine until it's so worn in that the tire ruts are so deep I can't get out. But I will be honest, both this week and last week, I have not thought a ton about this. And you mentioning it is bringing it back to mind and getting me excited again to make that my season's theme. Come, Lord Jesus. So is that alone enough? By the way, you never put a number to your experience. So I put a number to my experience, and I put it at about a three. So one, I'd love for you to share where you're at. But secondly, is this idea of come, Lord Jesus, all in and of itself, enough to take you from your number that you are at today to the next number above it. Where am I initially at before I come to the come Lord Jesus thought? I would say that I am typically somewhere around a six. I am more satisfied than dissatisfied, but I have a nagging sense that something significant is missing, that I'm wanting more. And I'll tell you what, I do think that one thought gives me the framework to see the Christmas season very differently. And I am excited about that. Where does it put me? You'll have to ask me like 12 o'clock on Christmas Day uh, <laughs> as I reflect back. But it certainly invites me into a place of anticipation rather than a place of work. And I like that. It invites me to the spirit of Advent in a way that I love. So I think that offers me something very different. What about you? Yeah, it does. But similar to you, only when I think about it, which of course, right? Yeah. So my, my question to myself is, how do I think about it more? And I I think what I want to do is similar to what I described to you the other day offline. I mentioned to you that I recently drew up a rule of life and that I wanted to 
become more familiar with my own rules for myself and keep them handy. And so I took some time over my weekend and I shrunk down my rule of life into a small little printable size and I laminated it and I cut them out. And now I have four copies of my rule of life that'll fit in my pocket and I want to keep it with me. And I kind of want to do the same thing with hashtag come Lord Jesus. And I think what I want to do is I just want to write those words on a note card and I want to tape it to my dash because I'm in my car all the time. Hmm. I just want to remind myself that that's what I'm doing this year. I think that's my step. That's good. I I think for me, the practical step that always works when I want to return to something for a period of time, like a couple of weeks, like Advent, whatever, I need to make this just a daily alarm on my phone every Mm. day at a set time, this hashtag come Lord Jesus pops up. And the thing I love about it is it's a prayer that is brief enough that I can pray it in the midst of whatever. And so I'm going to make it an alarm on my phone. And I think that'll help me to kind of live in that space. I'm also intrigued You know, as we think about this being a hashtag and a social media thing, we have both recently installed this sort of new to me anyway, social media app, Be Real, that I mentioned. I'm just intrigued because Be Real is what I want social media to be. It tells you when you have to post. You have two minutes to post or you don't get to post that day. It takes a picture from both sides of your phone at the same time. So it sees you and what you're doing. And it posts that. No filters, nothing complicated. It's just there. I am going to use that to be a reminder for me as well, because it's at random times every day. Whenever it buzzes at me, I am going to try to make that a moment where I invite Jesus to come. I'm going to pray that prayer as I post on Be Real. Nice. Yeah, I was thinking about that alarm idea and thinking, man, wouldn't it be cool if we could have a variable alarm like Be Real, where it would just pop up at certain times? And I want somebody has to have designed an app. If you are out there, audience members, and you know of an app that has a variable alarm like that, I would love to know about it. If you are an app developer and you would like to make money off of this idea, please steal it, make the app, and then tell me how to use it. Seriously, because I have looked for this app. Like I have spent hours looking for this app because I regularly have things like this that I want to come back to, but I don't want it to be always at 138 or whatever. Um, (laughs) Yes. It's why I think Be Real is such a creative idea because it meets an actual desire that I have actually had before they did it. But yeah, if somebody can tell us where that app exists, I would be thrilled. Yes. Ah, uh, this is awesome. Thank you for such a good conversation. I, I'm going to think a long time about what I would make my annual traditions be if I could control the church's liturgy. But more than that, I really want to keep thinking on this come Lord Jesus, because I think that is exactly what I need to increase my God satisfaction score for Christmas. <laughs> if that's your scale. Yes. But um, yeah, so we have already turned to the audience and invited participation. I want to reiterate, we'd love to hear from y'all. And in the meantime, while you're thinking about what you're going to post on social media, I'd love to turn the conversation over to Josh from Missouri, and I'd love to hear what else you're thinking about. Man, so I have, as I've often mentioned, I regularly use this app called Halo that leads through a kind of contemplative reading and rereading and rereading of a very short passage. And I use it almost every day, either in my devotional time or when I'm driving or whatever. But it had, I've been thinking a lot about what is it about the kind of movement that this app leads me through in reading the Bible that is meaningful to me? And what is it about the sort of approach to reading the Bible that is so powerful for me. And what I think I've gotten it down to, 
And this is my thought, is that it invites me to read the passage three times, and there is a three-part movement that it invites me to that has become really valuable to me in my devotional life. And simply put, it invites me first to listen to the passage and then to think about the passage. Just, just think about what the passage is saying. Then I listen to it again, and it invites me to talk to Jesus about it. And then it invites me to listen to it again. And then instead of even talking to Jesus about it, it just invites me to sit with Jesus and just be with Jesus, and that's it. And that progression of about, to, with is really valuable to me. Even as we have talked, you and I have talked about in prayer, there's a target that we're aiming for that we, not in a legalistic sense, but there's sort of a, it, did I get what I was going for out of my devotional life? Mm-hmm. And in a sense, I think the three rings for me of the target, the outermost ring may be about. I thought about God in my devotional life. The middle ring may be two. I talked to Jesus in my devotional life. And the innermost ring may be I was simply able to be with Jesus. Hmm. And that, I think, ultimately is the target I long for. And so this this progression of about to with really has been crystallizing in my mind. I love that you summarize it that way. This method of reading the Bible, as you know, I mean, is called Lectio Divina, or sacred reading. And this Lectio Divina has been around for a very long time in the church's history. It's been used very profitably over time. And there are lots of books out there about using Lectio Divina and lots of ink spilled over how to do this. But you summarized it in three words, which is why you're never going to sell a book on this topic. Like, you know, right? <laughs> right. I was thinking about that. I was like, man, this should be a book, except that it would be like the world's shortest book ever. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Big A, little A, what begins with A? About. Uh, so, uh, yeah. That would be awesome. If I could ever suck children into doing it this way, um, I would be happy to write a children's book. Yeah, right? Uh, Lectio Divina for kids. But yes, about, to, with. That summarizes it so well. I love it. Yeah. What about you? What have you been thinking about? Yeah. So some of our listeners, nobody has ever asked us this, but I, I think some of our listeners may ask at some point and maybe have already asked in their minds. Are they ever going to dive into controversial topics? And Ooh. we have, right? And we have actively decided the answer is no. And the reason the answer is no is not because those are not worthy topics, but because there is so much polarity in our world over these topics that we find them to be distracting to actually following Jesus. Like, I think those, the questions surrounding following Jesus are far more important to us than any of the controversial topics that are out there. And so we have decided as a podcast, we're going to focus on the majors and let the minors be handled by others. So I at least want to point to a thoughtful, engaging, wise good author that engages some really controversial topics. I just Ooh. finished. Yeah. I just finished. I didn't know there were the, those. Uh, there are. And I am super impressed. Uh, if you have not already looked into this guy, uh, Dr. Preston Sprinkle, he heads up a ministry called Center for Faith, Sexuality, and Gender. And he also runs a podcast called Theology in the Raw, which is fantastic. And he engages very thoughtfully from a conservative Christian perspective 
on the issues of homosexuality and gender identity. And I've read both his book, People to be Loved, which is the title of his book on homosexuality. And I just finished Embodied, which is his book on uh, the trans community. Whether you agree with him or not, you will appreciate his love for the gay and the trans community. He absolutely loves people and particularly loves people that have been marginalized by the church through the controversies surrounding these issues. He does come at it from a very conservative Christian theological stance, but man, he is calling the church into an act of love, into an act of service, into better understanding, and certainly more engagement, both with people and with the topics themselves from a non-heightened emotional state. I really appreciate what he's doing. And even if you take a different stance than him, I think you're going to appreciate his love and the heart with which he does what he does. That's awesome. I am so excited. I have not read anything by him. And I love the thought that there is a follower of Jesus who is trying to think and speak both intelligently and lovingly about really important topics that are very pertinent to people who are trying to follow Jesus today. So that's great. I really look forward to digging into his stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Which brings us to the Witch Josh question. Ooh, here we go. I know. We always like have this moment of confession or catharsis in this moment. It's always like mildly embarrassing, and then we end the episode as quickly as possible. Yes. So, well, and today's episode is going to be no different. <laughs> exactly. So, which Josh nearly failed all of his science classes in college? And that is me, Josh from Oregon. I was not much of a science guy. I still am not much of a science guy, though I have learned to appreciate it. My oldest son fell in love with science because of a great science teacher he had in high school. So he runs circles around me with science knowledge. But yeah, in college, it just wasn't a priority. And so my biology class was like at 730 in the morning or something like that. So I slept through almost every one of those classes. Uh -huh. And then... We had a life sciences class, I think is what it was. At any rate, the professor told us on day one, I don't care if you show up or don't. Pass the class or don't, that's up to you. I was like, okay, I'm not going to show up then. And I just like look in the syllabus and find out when the test was and kind of try to cram for it and show up and barely pass the test. And that's kind of what I did with that class. So there you go. I got two Ds in science because I just didn't pay attention. And now this is on a recording and now my kids know about this. So that's wonderful. That's hilarious. See, I had gotten that out of my system in high school. I almost failed science in high school. And so by college, I had already played that card and couldn't do it again. <laughs> You'd learn from your mistakes. Well, and I was in my, at least the science class I can remember most clearly, I did an earth science class as a J-term class. So we were doing it in three weeks and I did it with some friends. Uh, oh. And so that at least made it mildly more interesting. Yeah, it would. And when it's the only thing you have to focus on and most people mm -hmm. aren't even taking a class at that moment. Yeah, that's kind of nice. And the weather is rotten. So there's not like a lot of things to do. Right. Yes. Yeah, so that all made it a significant amount easier. Well, are we on for next week? We sure are. I am looking forward to it. All right. Well, I'll talk to you next week. We better end quickly because we're embarrassed. <laughs> all right. Goodbye. All right. Bye.